uh, Casey Limits Gravity. We are very happy to have uh, Anna Rothstein here in person who's going to tell us about non unitary effects in binary stuff. Thank you. So I first want to apologize for the bait and switch. Those of you wanted to hear about forward scattering, um, but I hope you'll still find this, this talk interesting. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today is something that hasn't been touched upon yet. Um, and that is uh, absorptive effects in, in spirals. So by non-unitary, of course, I don't really mean non-unitary. I just use the term non-unitary to distinguish um, uh, di dissipative effects, which are often used in conjunction or to describe radiative effects and radiation reactions. That's not what I'm talking about. So non-unitary in the sense that if we don't keep track of the deg degrees of freedom internal to the structures that we're looking at. So we're doing it inclusively uh, from the point of view of the short distance. Well, it's not really short distance as I'll discuss, but in, in terms of the internal dynamics of, um, of, of the constituents. So this is work that um, part of it dates back to a long time with Walter and more, I'll tell you about more recent work with uh, Jingping Li as well. Okay, so um, as we've discussed in great detail, there's uh, been a huge amount of work in calculating the conservative unitary effects. And again, unitary meaning both potentials and to lesser extent radiation by the, by the amplitudes community, certainly by the GR community and Blanchet's group have done a tremendous amount of work on radiation. Uh, but um, it, in terms of non-unitary, meaning internal dynamics, the amount of work has been relatively uh, small in comparison. Um, but uh, especially given the fact for black holes that the, uh, the, Wilson, the, the love numbers vanish, the first finite size effects for black hole scattering that will show up in the data are the non-unitary effects, right? The mass and angular momentum absorption of the black hole. So those are the first finite size effects. And moreover, they're large in the PN expansion in the sense that the, you know, the ultimate goal to extract love numbers to test whether or not the love numbers are actually zero is to get the 5 PN accuracy. And um, in fact, for, so for, um, for non-spinning holes, the absorptive effects start at 4 PN. And for spinning holes, there's an enhancement due to super radiance and uh, leads to 2.5 PN. So that's a, that's a big important effect, as you can tell. I mean, most of the calculations we've discussed here have gone well beyond that at this point. So there's a bit of catching up to do uh, from this part of the, uh, of the template building process, okay? So let me tell you what's been done. So the pioneering work was done by Eric Poisson in 2004 where he calculated um, the, uh, um, the, the power loss for, for black holes. Um, uh, so he did it by solving the, the Tucholsky equate, well, sorry, the, for, in the non-spinning case first. He did, also did it for the spinning case. Um, and Walter and I uh, did the power loss uh, using the EFT method way back in 2005. Um, and we sort of generalized what Eric did uh, in that we were able, because of the way EFT factorizes short distances from long distances, once you calculate the long distance effects, the short distance effects can simply be plugged in. So it doesn't matter whether or not it's a black hole or a neutron star. So we were able to generalize these results for neutron stars in terms of some unknown parameters, which I'll talk about. And more recently, Walter and I re returned to this question uh, in the context of the PM expansion, uh, given the interest in that. Uh, so we generalized it to the, we calculated a scattering angle. How the scattering angle can be used is still, I believe, an open question because it is absorptive. So the maps are, are, are different. Uh, but we also uh, were able to calculate the equations of motion directly as opposed to just the adiabatic power loss. Um, so for the spinning case, uh, in the same paper, Eric also did the, um, uh, the spinning case, 
uh, limited to certain spin configurations. R here is the orbital uh, plane, defines the orbital plane. Um, and then Raphael in his thesis did uh, the leading order of power loss, uh, a leading order in spin, uh, and um, did it again for general compact objects because he did it in the in the EFT method. So he didn't he didn't have these pieces here, which are nonlinear in the spin. Um, so subsequent to that work, there was um, this paper by uh, by Poisson and his collaborators, where they went to next to leading order uh, and calculated the flux again for these limited for uh, r dot s equals zero. Um, and there seems to be a discrepancy, as the authors point out, between the probe limit, uh, which had been previously calculated, and their results. In fact, so mostly, I think there were the pi squared terms didn't seem to agree. So this is still an open question. So this is a 3.5 pn result, which is obviously very important for the templates. Um, so this, uh, so uh, Penko and Enlick. Um, did the, uh, calculated the equations of motion using EFT. They work for linear order and spin. They also generalize compact objects. And more, most recently, my work with Walter and Jingping, we um, also have only done the leading order piece, but we got the equations of motion. We did it for a general compact object, and we have arbitrary spin configurations. Okay. So um, in the EFT approach, uh, following Reggie and Hansen, uh, we introduce a, uh, a tetrad which relates the global frame to the local co-rotating frame, as you're all familiar with, uh, which defines an angular generalized angular velocity. So then, as usual, you write down the most general uh, RPI action with some uh, spin supplementarity condition, which we are, we've chosen to be the covariant one, most convenient to use, as everybody knows. Uh, and so in here, there's an Einbein, which is used to uh, enforce the mass shell constraint. And this is just P dot X. Uh, now, if you think very generally, then this M can be some arbitrary function of the spin and the momentum squared. Uh, and if we knew that function, that would tell us the Reggie trajectory. So for whatever object you're looking at, you would have to match for that, uh, for that function. So um, uh, the equations of motion, the constraints come from varying these as our, uh, our canonical variables. Uh, these are conjugate after imposing constraints on the, uh, uh, on the tetrad. Okay, so um, uh, if we're if just interested in finite size world line, uh, uh, I should say conservative effects, then you all know you write down a set of local operators e squared and b squared, one term which has been overlooked, not overlooked, but I mean, people realize this, of course, is that this violates parity. Uh, but what's kind of interesting is to think about, well, you know, the standard model violates parity maximally. How do we know that whatever dark matter is out there that could form stars, compact objects necessarily uh, um, doesn't violate parity maximally. So um, it's interesting to ask, how does this e dot b operator uh, affect observables. And actually my student um, has worked this out and he's got a paper coming out where there are actually some really interesting novel effects in terms of the orbital dynamics that show up due to parity violation, which shouldn't surprise you because some configurations which are disallowed by parity are now allowed. So uh, hopefully they would stick out like a sore thumb in the signal, but of course processing that parity violation through um, the template machinery uh, would take uh, further work. Okay, so now let's talk about um, uh, the non-unitary effects. So um, in general, we might think that compact objects have, are gapped, right? Because they have some sets of normal modes. But you have to remember that these normal modes are um, quasi-normal in the sense that they're not, they're, they're, their poles are away from the real axis. So they decay and they have very broad widths. So you can excite them with arbitrary low frequency modes. So we might think that we can integrate out the UV modes and then forget about it, but as a consequence of the coupling to radiation, that's just not true. So this is true in any absorptive material, right? It only takes, it, it, there's no gap to, to, uh, to, to, um, to, 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 to um, exchange energy with the system, right? So as a consequence, there's, a, there's an infinite number of degrees of freedom. 
We're, we're not going to try to model them. We're going to do it in a model independent way. In principle, if you had uh, for, for a black hole, for instance, where you know the quasi normal mode spectrum, uh, at least numerically, then um, in principle, you could um, uh, understand that from microscopics, but it's not really necessary because we're going to, in the end, we're going to do a low energy expansion and a match to uh, the Reggie Wheeler or the Tucholsky equations. Okay, so the interesting thing about um, this from an EFT point of view is, is that uh, P and S are no longer fundamental variables. They're now actually thought about as composite operators in terms of the X degrees of freedom, okay? So P, we won't vary the action with respect to P and X. We'll vary the action with respect to X to get our equations of motion and our constraints. Um, okay, so this, so notice that there's the X have some unknown action which determine its dynamics uh, that will actually determine in the end what the, act, the mass of the object is. So to understand the uh, absorptive effects, we have to add some coupling to the curvature. So um, we lift the cues from the normal um, coupling to the world line um, to, to be operators on some Hilbert space which sits on the particle. Of course, it's all classical, so we're just using the usual op, uh, QFT terminology uh, abusively. Um, okay, so now if we want to do um, absorption, uh, then the, as everybody knows, the in-out formalism is no longer sufficient, and we have to use schwinger keldish in-in, uh, calculate a, an effective action, which isn't necessarily time-symmetric. So this gives, gives you all the right propagators in this formalism. It tells you know, the, there's, no, there's no thought. It's just turn the crank. It gives you all the right propagators, all the right time symmetries for the system. So the, doubling, the doubled action is you double the variables, you have a path that goes forward, it meets with some boundary condition that goes backwards in time and allows you to calculate um, uh, time-dependent quantities uh, in, in, in states just by going backwards and forwards. And it's actually just corresponds to just squaring the S matrix. Okay, um, so then the, the action, uh, the effective action can be used to read off the equations of motion uh, where so these deltas correspond to um, the, the varying the degrees of freedom, which I showed the canonical variables, which I showed you before. And then once you vary the action, you set the, the variables going on one side of the path equal to the variables on the other side of the path. Um, and then, for instance, if you vary with respect to the Veerbein, <clears throat> then you can see how the, um, the, the mass shell constraint occurs. So now if I turn off interactions between um, uh, between the, the external field and the internal dynamics, then you just P squared just becomes the energy of, uh, in terms of the Hamiltonian for the X degrees of freedom. Okay, so if we vary with respect to X, which is, is one of our canonical variables, then we get the usual mass, um, mass is Petri equation, plus um, these extra terms uh, that couple to uh, the expectation value of the quadrupole moment in whatever state of the system that you're interested in. So these, quad, these expectation values can be gotten from linear response theory. So to linear, oops, uh, sorry. So to linear order, uh, all we need to know is the retarded Green's function. So the retarded Green's function is defined in this way, which is time asymmetric, it's causal. So, um, now, the next assumption we make is that there are no long time tails. In other words, if you set the system ringing, it decays, and then eventually at time scales relative to the, to the time scales of the orbit, the, it's the, all, those, all those ringings are over by the time you've gone one orbit. So it's a very fast response. So that in, in momentum space, what that does is that in energy space, I should say, allows us to expand in frequency. So we have Q will be, have some unknown coefficients here. These are some tensors in terms of velocities. Uh, and then this d by ds is the first time derivative uh, on, on the E field. So we do an expansion in small time derivatives of the external field, uh, which is exciting the object, okay? So these coefficients include all the love numbers. So presumably these are, or these have been claimed to be zero uh, for the curved black hole. So the first uh, dissipative effect, or I should say, so these are not I would call these conservative. These time reversal breaking are, are the first dissipative effects show up in these coefficients here. 
So you have to match to the full theory, as we will, as I'll show you how to do in a second, to get those coefficients. Okay, so the interesting thing about superradiance is that these the reason spin is enhanced effectively mechanically is is that these derivatives act also act on the local rotating frame, so you can trade basically in a, a little omega the frequency which is small for the big omega, uh, the rotation of the black hole, right? So you're just trading little omega for big omega, so you're trading up, and that's why you go from four to two point five pn in the spinning case. Okay. Um, so now um, we vary the action with respect to the, the, the uh, tetrad, um, subject to the constraints uh, that it obeys its usual condition. And uh, we get this, the usual spin equations of motion. But in addition, we get these effects from uh, the absorptive part of the coupling to the internal degrees of freedom. Now, to get a relationship between P and X dot and S and omega, normally we would vary with respect to x and pi of x, but, um, but of course we don't know what the action is. So instead you can actually get these relationships by just making sure that the spin supplementarity condition uh, is, um, is, uh, is, is, is time independent. And that gives a relationship between the two. So in principle, it gives you this relationship. And you can see that if I drop these terms and you would see that, uh, that if I drop this and this, you'd see that P would just be proportional to x dot. That these are going to give corrections to that relationship. Um, so using the previous results for S dot and MP, then we can just get the mass loss uh, and the spin loss. And these formulas actually, not in disguise, uh, were, um, uh, were actually first found by Eric uh, a long time ago. It slightly, of course, didn't look like this, but. Um, okay, so now we need to solve for these induced moments. So these are the moments induced by the background field. And if we want to consider, uh, so this, this is a general space time if you put the system in, uh, but now we want to put the, uh, constitu the constituents together. So um, the, 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 the mass loss we're interested in here will be in the background of uh, a binary in spiral. Okay. Um, so we, these, uh, these cues I said before can be written in terms of convolutions of the background field with um, retarded Green's functions, but instead uh, will be much more general and will match the Whiteman functions. The Whiteman functions are the basic building block to all two-point functions. And so you have the Whiteman functions, you can get everything. Uh, we did this originally because we were interested in quantum mechanical effects. So, uh, if you're interested, say, in um, uh, uh, the effects of Hawking radiation, um, then um, uh, you would need the Whiteman function. So, so there have been claims that you could see uh, Hawking radiation in classical observables. So what we actually proved in this paper was that um, no classical observable, if you believe in the basic tenets of quantum field theory, a locality of the effective world line theory uh, and all the symmetries you believe are good symmetries. There's no classical observable can ever be sensitive to, um, uh, uh, to uh, Hawking radiation. So if, so if there are claims then they have to somehow get around those basic assumptions. And I think if you tried to mess with the world line theory in a way which would change that, then it would destroy everything that we've already checked. So I would, I'm highly dubious of, of any such claims. Uh, but what is interesting actually is that we were able to calculate new quantum gravity effects due to Hawking radiation. So we usually think about Hawking radiation as physical radiation, but there's also off-shell Hawking radiation. And we calculated the scattering off a of black hole to off-shell Hawking radiation. And it turned out to be the leading same order in M Planck or uh, Q over M Planck as the usual uh, one loop corrections to Newton's laws are the same order. So that, that's kind of interesting. Um, okay, so how do we extract the Whiteman functions? Well, the Whiteman functions basically just tell you the probability um, at leading order, at least to absorb a graviton or whatever spin particle you're interested in. Um, so uh, so, we're, so the, the scattering amplitude and the, so this is the, 
this is a result we're going to take from the full theory um, that was done by by um, Page a long time ago. Um, and in the effective theory, we just have two and basically, uh, sorry, so uh, yeah, this is the, uh, yeah, that's right. So this, right, I've already factorized it. So here's the amplitude in the effective theory, which is just an insertion of the Q dot E operator. Lambda is the helicity of the state they're interested in. Um, and then I'm not gonna go through the details, but you decompose it into a helicity partial wave basis, um, go to the rest frame of the, uh, of the black hole or whatever you're looking at. And uh, actually in this case, we're talking about a black hole. Uh, um, and then you just calculate the, uh, in the effective theory, what the, what the absorption probability is. So we ha you have to extract uh, this um, QQ correlator. So the final answer is written in terms of this QQ correlator. There's a sum over states here, X. So, uh, so if you assume that the internal dynamics of the black hole are unitary, so you can use completeness. Uh, again, an assumption that would be violated, would necessarily be violated if you wanted to see the Hawking radiation. Um, so uh, we want to extract the correlator from the full theory, okay? So this correlator in the effective theory, just from the group theory, it has um, five linearly independent form factors, these A, pl A, A pluses. So there are five sort of components to the Whiteman function in its most general form. Uh, and then you can write the in, the, in the EFT, the probability for absorption of a graviton can be written this way in terms of the sum over these form factors. And then you just compare it to the full theory result. So this is, um, this is the result of page. Uh, and then you just match, right? So uh, just going through the matching calculation, you can extract um, the, the Whiteman functions uh, non-perturbatively in the spin. So there's no perturbation theory in spin because the full theory is known non-perturbatively in the spin. So the effective theory you can match non-perturbatively in the spin as well. Um, so, and also that the E and B correlators are the same due to the uh, symmetry of, of uh, as explained in Raphael's paper do, uh, from his thesis, um, due to the symmetry of E and B. Okay, um, so now we need to relate the Whiteman functions to the retarded propagators, because that's what we're interested in for a classical observer, but we're not interested in quantum mechanics for this talk. Um, so they can be related by a, via a dispersion relation and um, breaking these two pieces up, uh, there's a principal part as well as this imaginary part. And this principal part is not distinguishable from the uh, local counterterms. That is, this principal part has a contribution from the love numbers. So um, um, uh, we don't want to double count. In other words, you know, in the action, we have the Q We've, we've turned Q into a dynamical degree of freedom. Usually when we write down E squared operators, we've assumed we've integrated out the Qs, right? So you don't want to include both the love numbers as well as, the, uh, as these pieces of the propagators because they're essentially, are, or they are describing the same physics. So you have a choice to either keep these and match those to love numbers or throw them out and just use the results of uh, pre previous results uh, for the love numbers. Okay, so, so we're calling this the non-local piece, even though it's, it's analytic in omega, but just we're calling this non-local because it's the calculable piece. It's the, true, it's the time reversal breaking pieces. Um, so that's just this piece of, that we're interested in. This piece we're gonna toss because, uh, well, we know there's zero to leading order in omega. And five minutes is question. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'm running out of time. Um, so this allows us to, to extract that part of the retarded Green's function. And then this allows us to calculate the induced quadrupole moment in terms of that result. This is the background field. These J's are just the generators of uh, angle momentum in the spin two representation. Okay, in the limit where omega is much less, so for maximally rotating, this reduces to this simple result. And uh, so the, the, so for a curved black hole, all the even in J3 terms uh, uh, vanish. This is just a statement. So these J, even in J3 terms correspond to the local counterterms. 
So this is the, the result. Uh, th this was the paper I was talking about, and as well as this paper, there were some issues here about interpretation, but um, uh, we can talk about that later. Uh, so, the, so those are the leading order finite size effects. Um, so if you just look in, in the title background, use after using that matching, this is what the mass loss looks like. This again was written down by Eric. Um, okay, and as well, actually, I'm not, don't remember which, which, uh, uh, which parts differ between here. I'm not sure if these had the complete result of Poisson. I don't remember. It's a long time ago. I checked that. Um, so now if we want to uh, calculate for the black hole, there's two contributions to the potential. There's the usual Newtonian one, and now the first finite size effects come from here. Uh, then we can just get the force on uh, the equations of motion we get by just varying the action with respect to x1. Um, and this is written in terms of the q. And uh, Similarly, we can vary the action to get uh, the, the spin equations of motion um, due to the, uh, the quadrupole induced quadrupole. So uh, for now the electric part of the vial tensor to leading order due to the, the companion is just this simple result, which allows us to write down a force law for the, as well as the spin equations of motion. Um, and if you set these terms to zero, then this agrees with uh, what Raphael did and with what um, Poisson did. Okay, so if we wanna do 3.5, we need to go to next order. So there are two pieces. This is work underway with Walter and Jingping. Um, so we need to match the Whiteman, uh, the Whiteman functions at next order. So we need to include the tail effect. Uh, and we also need to calculate the next order in the in ineffective action which corresponds to these diagrams to insertions of Q. Uh, and then we also need to extract the next order result from the, from the full theory. Um, now, the, the, as I said, the nice thing about the formalism is that because of factorization, you can recycle the same results. All you have to do is change some coefficients. So for a neutron star, uh, if you have some equation of state, then you could just calculate uh, the stress energy correlator actually simpler than this because you can you're, you're actually going to look at the low multiple moments so if you decompose this uh it becomes simpler but this is really a problem in sort of in condensed matter physics and and there's been a huge amount of work especially by hinderer and um and eric uh on neutron stars and their tidal responses um and it would be interesting to um to understand how to map those results onto these coefficients so once you know this in expansion omega then it's easy. There's a generalized power loss formula you can write down without doing any more work. Okay, so um, the non-unitary effects are start at 2.5 for maximally rotating objects. They're the leading finite size effects for black holes. Um, um, so the, the NLO power, so at 3.5, and angular momentum loss have, have the calculated, as I said, for, for special spin configurations. Uh, the equations of motion still have only been done at leading order. And as I said, there's a discrepancy here that we're trying to, we, hopefully we can sort out, um, we'll see. Um, and we need the generalized power loss for black holes as well as for neutron stars. So there's some work to be done, at least in this context, uh, for neutron stars. Um, and uh, we, need, we need these cross sections as a function of the equation of state. So there's work to be done here as well. So I, I would say that we're the non-unitary, uh, the non-unitary contributions to the templates are pretty far behind what most of these people in the audience have already surpassed these levels to much higher order. So uh, there's still some work that needs to be done here. Okay, thank you. Questions for Ira? Um, Ira, can you comment on uh, the importance uh, to the measurements? Like so, of yeah, so it's one thing to be formally 2.5. It's another thing to like, how does it affect? That's a, a question probably for an, an expert. Uh, I don't know if Alessandra is online. She would probably know off the top of her head. But maybe just some sense. You don't have to be precise. The only sense I have is that Alessandra told me it was important. Okay, good. good that's, that's, the, that's the only, I don't know what that means, but 
I, I, I trust her. So if she says it's important for, for certainly for EOB, then right. I believe it. Okay. And if it's true for EOB, it's probably true for the other method. All right, there's many questions. Uh, so maybe we take one more. I think the Zoom question came first. So maybe. Alfredo? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, I have a very naive confusion. So if we compute obstacles from scattering amplitudes, say we compute you know, a scattering angle or radiative momentum, we are basically imposing the unitarity. Uh, we, are, we are using the unitarity method, right? So we check that uh, on the cuts, everything is propagating on shell. So how is this unitarity loss uh, from that perspective? Oh, so I mean, in, in, from the from that perspective, I mean, clearly everything that you do in the QFT calculations are unitary, but it's just missing the degrees of freedom. So in that sense, it's not unitary, right? It's 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 certainly self consistent and unitary, but it's it's missing degrees of freedom. So that's why I'm saying the word unitary is a little bit of a misnomer, or non unitary is a little bit of a misnomer. Are these extra degrees of freedom? Are these additional yeah. states? Sorry. What? So David just asked, don't I mean? A different sense different, of yes. Yeah, everything is, of course, unitary. So uni non, I mean, there's no non-unitary physics. So whenever people say something's non-unitary, you could always ask, what the hell does that mean? Of course, it's unitary. It's just that you're not keeping track of everything that you should be keeping track of. Sorry, Alfredo, what did you say? Uh, no, if this corresponds to extra states or extra particles, or is there a notion of? Of this yeah. extra degrees of freedom, you know. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so I think we can delay the rest of the questions to Slack since we started late and we are running pretty late. So let's thank Ira again.